Welcome everyone. Come on in, come on in. I can picture you walking down the virtual hallway. We can hear the little chatter. Come on in, come on in. <laughs> See some familiar face, virtual faces here, seeing some names. Hi, friends. Come on in, come on. Oh, wow, we got some old friends in the audience tonight. It is really wonderful to have you here. Post, what do we call it, hurry quake. <laughs> in California. Good to be here. Come on in, come on in. Grab a nice warm cookie with some coffee or tea. <laughs> Do we have a private school village song we should sing all together before you begin? No? I usually have music, but you know, today we're just kind of shimmying. I don't know. Pick a shimmy, your favorite shimmy song as you come down the hall. I'll, I'll, I'll reserve my count. Okay, folks, we have a lot to cover tonight, um, and I really want to get us started. So you can hear from our esteemed panelists and who we are so uh, grateful and honored to have with us this evening, calling from around the country, um, way past their bedtime, but they are spending their evening sharing their expertise with the PSB community, and we are incredibly grateful that you are here with us to kick off um, our knowledge base and ground us in some great practices before the school year starts. Um, so welcome everybody, welcome to the PSV uh, Private School Village community. Uh, for those of you who are in Los Angeles, we wanna send a quick reminder for that October 8th uh, back to school picnic. We think of it as our, um, our family reunion. So come it's going to be an incredible time um, as usual so don't forget to rsvp for that um we really a, a few quick housekeeping pieces as you notice when you registered you were asked to submit some questions so we are going to prioritize those questions in our conversation tonight but feel free as we're going to add additional questions via the q a um and as always, this session is recorded and we will share that recording out with additional resources after this evening. So if you're registered tonight, know that you're gonna be able to access this at a, at a later date. Um, as usual, let's see. Um, in Additionally, when you registered, we shared an extended bio of each of our panelists tonight so we don't spend the time reviewing our bio. So please refer to that information. It, um, for additional information for each of our panelists. Um, and I wanna just give a quick introduction. So my name is Yatandia Daniels Rubenstein and I am a, a long time PSV parent and family just rotated off as the PSV um, or parent ambassador chair, um, but really excited to bring my expertise, my interest, my passion to you in terms of college admission access equity and creating spaces for our young people to thrive, very much aligned with the PSV mission. So I am so pleased, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, to be here to welcome to our community this evening, Mr. Tim Fields, uh, Ms. Veronica Howard, and Shereen Hernan brown who will be our expert panelists this evening. So I'd like to have each of them spend two quick minutes introducing themselves very briefly, as well as sharing maybe one or two, if the, if you forget everything that we said tonight, what is a major one or two takeaways that you want the audience to have? And I would love to start with you, please, Veronica. Yeah, hello, everyone. 
Um, I'm Veronica. I work in the undergraduate admissions office at the University of Chicago. Prior to that, I was at my alma mater, Kenyon College in Central Ohio. So I have worked exclusively in highly selective admissions offices. And so the, the one tip I want to give you there, if you or your child has highly selective institutions on their list, schools that can't admit very many students, um, I want you to remember there are two things that go hand in hand. Everyone thinks about strategy. And some of the things we're going to talk about tonight are very helpful strategic things that you should be doing or thinking about when you apply to highly selective institutions. But if you don't pair strategy with authenticity, Oh, you're just not going to get outcomes. So you want to know who you are. You want to take that moment to be introspective as a student, to be helpful as a family member. Uh, what are you great at? What do you need? What do you want? How am I going to build this list? What am I gonna... There's so many points in this process where if you really hone in on who you are and what you want and what you need and what you bring to the table, if you are authentic in the process, you pair that with strategy that you learn along the way and that can produce results. So just remember those always have to go together, especially if you have highly selective institutions on your list. You're on mute, I'm mute on deck. Of course I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, Shireen, can I ask you to pick it up? Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Shereem Herndon Brown. I'm the co-author of the book. Um, what was it called? The Black Family's Guide to College Admission: <laughs> A Conversation About Education, Parenting, and Race. I'm also the uh, founder and president of Strategic Admissions Advice, an independent consulting company that helps families to navigate the college admissions process. Um, if I have one thing, I'd like everyone to remember: tenth grade families. I think there's a critical time that you have assessments to understand what could be a potential major and or career, not saying you have to have it all figured out at 15 years old, but I think it's very important that kids apply to college with intention. And I think 10th grade is that time to start implementing that assessment or and getting an assessment and implementing a story and or a strategy. 11th grade families, please, please, please start looking at colleges for the, the right schools for the right reasons. I and mean, we're gonna talk a lot about that. So I think 11th grade is a great time to start building a college list for you to start visiting schools. And 12th grade families, essays, 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 I can't say more. We're gonna talk a lot about the Supreme Court decision and, and how essays affect that, but this should be your, your um, heavy essay writing time. And we hope that you're helping your child to brainstorm essays, um, but that you're helping them to proofread, not polish. So seniors, the essays, 11th grade college list, and 10th graders assessments. Fantastic. Thank you. Tim, bring us home. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Timothy Fields, uh, Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Admission at Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, been there for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, prior to that, I uh, worked with several access programs, TRIO programs, uh, also a graduate a Morehouse College and it has been, you know, uh, uh, you know, my lifetime, you know, really working in this space, promoting access for all students. But I also have a privilege of uh, being the co-author of the Black Families Guide to College Admission, a conversation in, about education, parenting and race with Shireen and have had the pleasure of working very closely with Veronica in the Chicago land area for the past uh, 12 years. Um, so just if nothing else, I just have a reflection to kind of set us up for this conversation. Uh, I got a little older, so I had to get some readers. Uh, so <laughs> as we are going to talk a lot about the Supreme Court decision, just wanted to, you know, give a couple words. Is this decision the end of the word? No. Black students will be, still be able to access higher education and go on to great success. But we are at a reflection point. Uh, there are questions Black families need to ask. Why do we hold co selective college and universities, most of which are predominantly white, with such high esteem? Um, with such high esteem. High esteem. Will attending one of these colleges truly benefit your child's academic, social, and emotional development? Would attending a historically black college or university provide your child with an education even more meaningful and useful? So I just want us to keep an open mind in this process, but also know that college and universities are still going to admit children. They're still going to look at them in a holistic way. There are going to be ample opportunities for them, but it is going to be imperative to keep an open mind as the selectivity is not going to get any smaller. Yeah, thank you so much. And that's actually a great segue to what I wanted to share as a, an additional grounding piece to our conversation tonight, you'll hear the term holistic very often. 
Um, and so you're walking away with what on earth does that mean? It means that colleges and university admission offices are considering multiple factors when evaluating a student. So let's think of seven, um, seven basic aspects, factors in the college admission process. One, GPA or rank. So who are you as, what is your performance? What has your performance been? Do you the student been for four years? Um, if the school doesn't have a GPA, there is still a way that the college and university can evaluate um, what the student has been doing. So think GPA and rank. If a school doesn't rank, that's okay. If they don't offer any, a GPA, that's okay. We can still evaluate that student well. Secondly, think of the high school rigor. Given what your school offers, what have you been able to take advantage of? What have you, how have you demonstrated your level of mastery in certain disciplines? How have you pushed yourself within your own expertise? So think high school curriculum and rigor. Um, think of scores. So yes, we're at that wonderful place where SAT specifically and ACT are considered um, optional at certain campus communities, but it is still a part of the admission process. It has not been removed. So sure, we're gonna say scores with an asterisk, but that is also a piece of this. Uh, think of the activities. What have you, how have you been engaging yourself, you the student, for your four years of high school? What have you tried? What have you deemed as important? How have you contributed back to your school community? Um, in what, and it could be in a lot of different ways. So think, yes, yeah, school community, but your home community. So activities and or leadership. Again, think of that in, a, in parental language. Think of your resume. Um, next is recommendation letters. Who is able to advocate and um, verify essentially what you have been doing with yourself, you the student, uh, over their time? And then the student's voice in terms of the application essay and a sort of series of essays. So that's a piece that the student has full control over. You tell us who you are. What will you be able to say? And um, the, everybody actually alluded to the, ref the reflection and the self-awareness that the student needs to develop over time. That can then come through in the student's essay. And finally, the cost. So for, for you as a family, the cost might be the first thing you consider. For the student, it may be the last thing they consider. For colleges and universities, that may, that may play in a huge part in how they're going to be evaluating you. So when we're thinking about the college admission landscape, don't just think of SCOTUS. Think of all those pieces that come before and how much or how little that scale will be tipped depending on the school you the, the college and or university you engage in later. Um, so think holistic and for depending on the school, it may be some schools may not consider your activities. Some may not consider your test scores. So all those pieces will play very differently on different college campuses. So I want you to keep that in mind and we'll send out resources after this. There's seven major factors, sure they're additional, but there are seven major factors that go into the admission review process. Um, anybody want to comment on any one of those factors? I, I would just simply underline that, you know, especially yeah. if you're looking at the more selective schools in the country, the rigor of the curriculum is always going to be the most important. That, you know, you know, people often say, oh, I have a 4.5 GPA. I don't know what that means if I don't know what classes they have taken. And so a lot of times people want to factor on the numbers in this process, but really it's what courses are you taking at the school that you are at? And if you are interested in the more selected schools, have you maxed out that curriculum that is available to you? Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that's one of actually the first questions that came in um, via the registration process. What, what are schools looking for in candidates? So sure, you've got that piece. Does anybody want to highlight um, the extracurricular piece? And very often in, in our private school community, there is a lot of questions about what, what activities look good. Um, does anybody want to comment on activities and or extracurriculars? How should students and families be thinking about that? Uh, I can start us off. I think so in addition to selective institutions, I've worked to the institutions I work for are residential institutions. So these are schools where you are living and learning on the same college campus. 
So they are not just thinking about a student as only a student, that is the primary piece of this process. Um, as Tim said, you know, we're digging into to, to your curriculum, your performance, that is true. But with residential institutions, I'm not just thinking about a student as a classmate, I'm thinking about them as a roommate and as a community partner. And I'm kind of thinking about the future, I'm thinking about them as an alum, right? An ambassador for our college, for our brand, for our type of school, whatever it is. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into this review in terms of what kind of person a student is, not just what kind of student. Uh, I think families are surprised that our our net is pretty wide. Like we're we're excited about things that make students excited. So everyone wants to know what's the one thing. Is it is it this instrument? Is it this sport? Is it this type of activity? It's really showing what you're excited about. So if you're excited, the person reading your application gets excited and they can see who you might be on that campus. Oh, this student does this and likes this and has tried that and is willing to do this. We can see that. We want to know that a student is gonna be involved beyond academics on a college campus because college is shockingly not only about academics. You wanna have that full rich experience of things you're gonna do outside the classroom. And so for us to be able to see a student who has that balance, who's learning how to do that, um, that's exciting. It's exciting as a reader to try and see into the future, like who that student as a community member might be. Wonderful. Shereem, any thoughts? No, I, I think I think Veronica nailed it. In something she said earlier, it's really about amplifying your authenticity. You know, and and that could be through activities, that could be through essays, but colleagues want to know who they're getting, you know, and it also goes back to institutional priorities, which you may not know. Right. You may not know what a school is looking for in any given year, hence why it's important that students, you remain true to who you are, understand that there's so many choices out there. And I know that sounds a little kumbaya-ish, but honestly, colleges don't want someone who packages themselves for what the college, for what they think the college wants. They can see right through that. So the more um, entrenched you are in the activity, then we definitely have a saying in college mission where you go deep, not wide, meaning really, really do something that you love. Um repeatedly and consistently and show and demonstrate that versus trying to just litter your your resume your activity sheet with a whole bunch of stuff because you think that'll be impressive it won't look it won't help you look impressive it'll just make you look scattered right so it's very very important that you're authentic to yourself and do things plural that really um you may ultimately like veronica said contribute to a college community yeah and i i want to weigh in quickly about in in defense of the scattered student so for the student who hasn't yet found their thing, um, you know, I'm thinking about my, when I was in the, in a, as a school counselor, a student who has tried a lot of different pieces and they haven't found their voice or they really uncovered themselves as a junior to be able to articulate that in the application. So if you have got it down pat as a freshman, amazing. If you have evolved over time and, and whittled your activities down to a handful that are most meaningful to you, fantastic. But don't leave it up to the admission team to guess what you find most interesting. You have to let them know, here was what I, here's the process I went through over time and why I find reading as the most important thing that I do, whatever it is, but definitely don't leave it up to chance for the admission team to guess about what you find most important. Um, there were a lot of, I think we covered, there are a lot of questions on how do we help students, how, are, how should parents and um, guardians help their students stand out in the process. And I think we've covered that. Is there anything else you wanna, anybody wants to mention about standing out or this idea about standing out? Well, what, what I say in a lot of my information sessions is if you know we're just gonna think about the most selective schools in the country is that more than likely you're not gonna be the best at anything. When an applicant pool is 30, 40, 50, um, 100,000, more than likely, you're not going to be the best at anything. But what can you be the best at? You can be the best at who you are. And so, yeah, we're going to beat a, a dead horse here and say that you have to be authentic. You have to be who you are. But it's true. Like if you say, yes, I'm the best, insert whatever sport, you know, insert, you know, whatever the activity is, more than likely in that larger applicant pool, there's somebody who's competed at the international level in that area. And so, you know, you shouldn't try and play that, I know I'm good because maybe in your school, you're great. Maybe in your neighborhood, in your, you know, Southern California, maybe you're the top. But then when you start getting these applicant pools that have applicants that come from all over the country, all over the world, it becomes a different story. So the best thing is just be the best of who you are. And that's the theme you'll continue to hear throughout this uh, conversation tonight. 
you turned a quick question and I know that we have a scripted question that we're going to answer, but people are asking questions in the chat. Is it, are you going to get to those? I mean, there's something I can answer. How do you want to handle that? You're on yeah, we'll get to those. We'll get, we want to prioritize those who um, ask questions ahead of time. We will get to the chat. Thank you. Did you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, there was a question about what are the trends in college admission, the current trends in college admission? Does anybody mean that, is there anything beyond what we have already covered that folks would like to highlight? What trends are we seeing in college admission? I, I think it's important to note that, you know, with Tim and Veronica here, we're looking at very selective schools. University of Chicago and Emory both have single digit uh -huh. admit rates. Emory might be at 10, Tim, am I right? Right. So what we have to remember is that the trend is that the more applicants there are, there aren't increasing more beds at colleges, right? There's, they're not building more buildings and more beds. So digital or electronic applications, the common applications, more kids are applying to 15, 25, 35 schools, but you they, they can't physically go to the same college. So I want, I think the trend is for people to, to throw more snowballs on the wall to see what sticks. Uh, Tim and I adamantly disagree with that. We really hope that students reply to the right schools for the right reasons. Obviously the trend, um, to go test optional, Columbia University being a selective institution, um, going test optional permanently is very impressive. Um, the the pandemic obviously initiated a lot of that, but a lot of schools have continued to do it. Um, and obviously, we're talking about Supreme Court stuff. You know, as this conversation goes on, I think the trends are students need to understand that selective colleges don't not like your kid or not not like you. We they just have so much availability. So we really, really have to reinforce that as colleges become more competitive, that we expand our thinking and redefine success so that kids have more options than they initially would if they just throw snowballs on the wall to see what sticks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, there's a pretty pointed question that I think is probably in a lot of people's minds in this room. How can private school students stand out in a highly competitive pool of outstanding private school classmates? So if you think of the questions that were already, the response is already given by Tim, um, and I think Veronica, you already touched on this. Is there anything else you wanna speak on specifically as it relates to private school students in this process? Yeah, I do. So um, yes. <laughs> I want to be very, I want to be very clear. So like you, Tunde, I've experienced uh, as a school counselor at elite private schools in New York City and in a uh, boarding school in Pennsylvania. And what's important that private school families know, and Tim says this all the time, as a private school, you know, family of color, if your resources um, are the same as all your peers, then college usually treat you no differently. Meaning kids who are privileged enough to have standardized test prep, you know, um, regular tutors in and out their house, you know, resources to travel and do a lot of academic programs. Green is the common denominator and, and colleges will then look at you as such. Right. So don't think that there's an advantage per se. And then the Supreme Court decision really says this of you being a family of color and and, you know, and having wealth that may not fly, that's number one. Secondly, as a private school family, you have awesome, ideally school counselors. And we are finding too often, families are not taking full advantage of that. You really, really must utilize your score, your Naviance, your Maya, um, Ciaflo, Maya Learning, whatever they call it, to under check the emails. They're sending out regular reminders of things to do. So to stand out, you gotta know the procedures and protocols. And in addition to that, Yes, well, I can you know, beat the dead horse of amplifying their authenticity, but if you don't kind of get in line or understand what your school's doing, then you're at a disadvantage and that's not something that you want to see. I agree with that. Well, you'll hear us circle back to various different versions of this exact response um, throughout the conversation. Um, so let's talk about SCOTUS. <laughs> First of all, if I can ask us to really give us the highlights what does SCOTUS say? What did the SCOTUS decision actually say versus what other, what folks think it actually says um, and then potential implications? Tim, can I ask you to start with that? 
Yeah, I'll, you know, start. And obviously, uh, Veronica has had a lot of conversations with this as well. I think the first thing to, to, to really simplify this is this Supreme Court decision really only deals with the review of the application. So just oversimplifying it, no longer race can be considered when you apply. So as Veronica and I review applications, we're going to have no idea of the racial and ethnic identity of that student. It has no bearing on how we're going to go about recruiting. We're going to be very targeted in the schools and in the students that we recruit. And then once students are admitted, how we go about yielding these students, we're going to be very targeted in that. However, as we review the application, uh, we are not going to know the identity of that student. And so I will stop there and then I will turn it over to Veronica to continue on kind of some of the nuances of that. Sure, sure. I have, in the last year, I've sat in on enough webinars about this decision. I feel like I've gone to law school. Like, I feel, I feel like I've re I'm ready with that degree. Um, yeah, I think, I think Tim mentioned the key pieces. So admissions people think about their process in three pieces. There's everything that happens before a student applies, that recruitment piece. We can do what we want there. We can care about diversity there. In the admissions process, we can still care about diversity at our institutions. We won't have a checkbox anymore. Like, like Tim said, we won't know the race and ethnicity per a checkbox of a student. Uh, and we, once we admit students, we care about bringing them to our campus, right? Tim and I fight over students. No, they're Chicago's. No, they're Emory's. We fight over students. We get to do what we want in that space too. So we've lost a checkbox on the application. That's actually, I mean, it's a big deal um, within the history of all the things that have happened with affirmative action in, in college admissions. It is, it's a big, big decision. Um, but what the ruling did say was that even though there is not a checkbox, there are all the other spots in the application where students and uh, school mentors and teachers and staff, you still get to share who you are. So your reader could still have a sense of who you are, even though you didn't check a box because you wrote an essay that shared something about who you are. Someone said about something about a great activity you've led that says about who you are. Um, essays, which were always supposed to be personal, right? Personal statements. They say who you are as a person. So can we still have a sense of who you are? Yes. Will we have a checkbox? No. Will race be a leading piece in admissions? No. Um, we, colleges have gotten lots of advice now um, from the government about, again, what they could do within their recruitment, within their yield of their admitted students. There's a lot of wiggle room left, but we have lost a checkbox. We have lost uh, some of the ways in which we've done the work in the past, and that work has to change going forward. I think it was really clear with all of the updates we got from the government recently that your institution's mission doesn't change. So if you're a college that says you care about diversity on many levels and you care about bringing students of color to your historically white or predominantly white campus, if you know if you know that parts of who you are are really still who you are, you still get to do that work. But now it is on the colleges to make sure that they are doing that work well in the recruitment and yield spaces. And I think uh, if you didn't have the privilege of, of doing that well in the past, that, that's going to be hard. There will be a learning curve there, I think, for lots of colleges um, who maybe didn't have the resources to do all the recruitment work they wanted or all the resources to do all the yield that they wanted. Uh, it will be extra work, but colleges still get to stand by their own missions. And so if diversity of their student body is an important mission, that's still in their mission, and they now get to figure out new ways in which they will have a diverse funnel of applicants coming into their college uh, a diverse set of students that they're admitting, a diverse set of students that they're bringing to their college in new ways. There's there's a lot of new coming for colleges in the way they work, even though their mission can stay the same. And and if I can just, you know, add this, you know, really, um, this case deals with a very small amount of colleges and universities. There are 4,000 colleges and universities throughout the country, 2,000 offer bachelor's degrees, and really this decision affects maybe 100, 120 at the most. The majority of colleges that offer bachelor's degrees admit the majority of people who apply. And so in thinking about this case, you really have to say it's really going to apply at these hyper-selective places that have admit rates under 20, 15, 10 percent. But the majority of college and universities, uh, this is not going to affect, this is not going to change how they go about doing things because they had to admit the majority of their students because of kind of their applicant pools. And so that's why we want people to keep an open mind like this by no means is the end of the world. You know, people are going to continue to go to colleges. There are lots of opportunities. But just know if you are thinking about the top 100 schools in the country based upon the U.S. News and World Report that none of us really actually care about, then you are throwing yourself in the deep water and you're going to have to kind of navigate some of these things.
Let me just follow up. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Shreem. I was going to ask the two of you a question because both of you work in admission. And again, I know we're staying on task with with the questions uh, that were submitted earlier, but I think someone just put a good one in the chat. Mm -hmm. Do you think that since there's no longer a chef box, if a student identifies their race in an essay, will this be redacted prior to the admission review? So the ruling is colleges are still, they're working with their legal offices to interpret the ruling and all the stuff we just got from the government. Uh, The ruling says... So we won't have the che- the common application. You fill that out. It won't offer us a checkbox. We won't have a checkbox in our system. The reader who reads your application won't have the checkbox they used to have. That demographic checkbox is gone, right? That's part of the ruling. Uh, that does not mean we have to redact any sense of who you are in the application. So if you mention race and ethnicity in a personal statement, again, if someone mentions something that you do as part of an activity, part of your community, part of your family, that holistic uh, sense of who you are as a person gets to stay in the application. The ruling made a comment where it was, um, so if, let's say you write an essay, your personal statement, something about that personal statement is about your uh, racial or ethnic identity. So the reader is supposed to assess not just what you've disclosed as a race, that's the old model, we can't use that model anymore. What you're supposed to be doing is a holistic review of what you've shared. And so the essay would not just be about race and ethnicity. It would also probably yield information about qualities, personhood, experience, what you could contribute to a community. And those pieces we can still value. So they are intertwined with who you are, but they are not a checkbox. So colleges will not have to redact that information. Your reader will not have a checkbox when they read your application anymore. But in any part of an application, you and others who work with you gets to still share who you are. And that includes race and ethnicity, not solely race and ethnicity, but how your race and ethnicity has shaped you. You want to think about the qualities and characteristics, because that's the part that the college gets to lean on still in the admissions process. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want everybody to remember that the qualities, the qualities are what are being extracted for in a much more explicit way than in the past, um, where offices could have just plucked by demographic, lazy offices, um, but now the qualities are being extracted. So we go back to our com- our comments at the top of the hour about the importance of self-awareness um, and you as a family having conversations about who you are, where you have come from, um, helping the student understand the process that they go through, as the student then writes the essay, as the student then speaks to a recommender about here was what here is why I think you're great for me, those qualities can bubble to the top. So the admission team doesn't have to guess about grit and character and um, community mindedness and civic mindedness and pack passion and compassion. There shouldn't be any guesswork around it, even if race is included. Um, so it's the, there is work for us as college counselors, but families can really, now you don't have to, you can really lean into that dinner table conversation. Think about family, talk about family, talk about experiences, think about perspective. What is, what is the neighborhood that we live in? Why do we do what we do? How do we arrive to where we are now? Super, super important. The qualities is something that co- colleges and universities get to lean into heavily now. I'm going to say that a million times over <laughs> to remind you of that. Um, so the, the the question then that we've heard a lot of folks say, oh, if race is now removed, what's going to happen with HBCUs? Um, will HBCUs be overrun? Will, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of chatter around that. Does anybody want to take, what will HBCUs do? I mean, I think HBCUs will do what they've always done for, you know, nearly the past 200 years. They will educate and have open access to populations who want to consider uh, those schools. Um, You know, what I will say is, you know, the numbers just aren't there. Like, you know, there are only 100 historical black college universities in the country and, you know, they could not, you know, educate all the black students. So that's just not realistic, but it's also not realistic that all students want to go to those spaces. But I do think they will continue to serve as options uh, for students. Uh, You know, we were on a a panel uh, with uh, Joe Montgomery, who's the Vice President of Enrollment at North Carolina A&T. And he says, these institutions have always been mission-based. 
They have never been solely for Black people. Uh, they've been for all who wanted to come. And so, yes, they'll continue to serve that role and that people are open to them, then obviously they're there. But, you know, they are not going to take on, you know, kind of the role of educating all Black children. That that they've never done. They've never done that or well, they have not done that since the mid, uh, you know, 20th century. Um, and so can, it's just fe not feasible to do that. So they're not going to become the de facto place. Uh, you know, I think institutions, as has been said, still have their uh, goals of diversity. They still have their values. I think they're still going to work towards those and do all they can to uphold uh, diversity at their institutions uh, through their admission practices. Yeah, thank you so much. So the takeaways from everybody is, it is what it is. The SCOTUS has said what they needed to say. Let's lean into who we are as folks and teachers, how to be most self-aware in the application, reflect their the experiences in a really coherent manner in their writing, um, and they will be okay because there are 4,000 colleges and universities. So SCOTUS answered, let's think about test optional. We've been throwing that around and we are pretty comfortable with test optional, but for those, we've got some ninth and 10th grade parents in the room. What on earth are we talking about? What is test optional? Is it really test optional? Veronica, can we start with you? And we'll go to you, Yeah, Shalene. sure. Uh, so U Chicago was the first highly selective institution to go test optional prior to the pandemic. Uh, and the, when the pandemic hit, we had colleagues at other colleges asking us if we would do some training sessions. Like, could we figure this out? We have to move into this space really quickly. And you all already did it. I think the average college that is test optional means it. They the, One of the weird things that the pandemic gave us was this boom in the test optional space. It's a good thing overall. Uh, so it gave us that. And many colleges were eager to go that route. So th this is, this is, it could be a good thing for lots of students. I think the average college, when they say test optional, they mean it. That if you don't submit, it won't necessarily hurt you. That doesn't mean that at some colleges submitting good test scores, and we'll talk about what that means. I know there were questions earlier about good test scores, um, couldn't help you. And there are many things in an application that helps you, but not anything has to hurt you. So I would say the colleges that are telling you they're test optional, they mean it, they're test optional, they won't penalize someone, you can't make assumptions about a test score if a student hasn't turned it in, that's just not a piece that they will evaluate. There are a couple of things to probably consider there. I, I do think the movement because of the pandemic into the test optional space was a good thing overall, but it's really confusing. So there was a question earlier in the chat related to this, you know, what's a good SAT score? There is no one answer to that because it depends on you and your strengths and your academic interests and the colleges on your list and where you go to school and what you've learned. There are so many things that, that I would need to know for me to give you any kind of information about an individual test score. I don't think it's one single test score, one single band. I think the wonderful people that you are connected with at your schools and this community, the, this is the strategy part, right? The people who know this work and know you, there's a lot of strategy here in terms of what tests you take and whether you submit them to which colleges on your list. So it's a good thing we're in this space. It is more confusing and it does take more of the strategy work um, because there isn't one answer. There's not one test score that's the be all end all cutoff. Many colleges that practice what we said earlier, holistic admissions, um, there was never cut off to begin with. I mean, even when we required testing, it wasn't like we set that line and said, well, anything under this we wouldn't consider. I think the way colleges use it will differ greatly by college. Um, it could differ for students based on what they wanna study. There are a lot of, lot of different factors here. Um, I will say overall, one of the things that we think about along with some of our peers, um, what are you doing in the future? So I have students who are very eager to come to uh, a highly selective institution like UChicago to be pre-med. They want to be doctors. I hate to break it to you, but doctors take a lot of tests to become doctors. And so part of the evaluation there is, could you be test optional and go to a selective institution as a pre-med student, as an aspiring bio major? You could, we're gonna to have to know from everything else in your application that you're prepared for that route. But I think that's one of the things that we have noticed in the last couple of years of doing this work that if you are the type of student, not everyone has to know what they wanna do, but if you're the type of student who's found that thing and you have professed everywhere and building your application lists, building you know all the things you wanna do, applying to college, something that you wanna do is reliant on testing or there'll be testing in your future. You do wanna think about that. And there are some tools you can use um, many that are free tools, many that are easily accessible tools, people that will build out tools for you and show you cool things. 
to maybe work on it. Because even if it's not an important part of your application process now to college, you could see that later on down the road, your, your profession might be impacted about you know, test scores, graduate school, placement for professions. So we have told students, think about that long-term. It, it may not hurt you now, but becoming accustomed to test for some professions might be particularly helpful. Thank you. So Shereen, as you're working with students, how do you, what's that conversation like? It's really, it depends on each student, like Veronica said, and what their ambitions are. Um, I love how, thank you, Veronica, for reinforcing the fact that if a student has science or, you know, uh, medical aspirations that take, or even business, right, Series 7s and MBAs, like th this part of the process. So it's a very personalized thing. Um, I do, Tim and I, and I'm going to include you in this one, Tim, encourage students to take the test, to be prepared with it, and then make the decision on whether they're going to submit it. I'm, you know, if you are... If your kid or excuse me, for students are here, if throughout your, your history and you've taken an assessment, a diagnostic, and you're just not a good test taker, then yes, I don't want you banging your head against the wall in preparation for a test that you know isn't going to vault over a score that you believe is going to be Harvard-esque. I'm just going to use that. But I do think, and Harvard doesn't require, right, from from pandemic, but the <laughs> bottom line is we want to make sure that students are doing it appropriately. But at the same time, it's a very, very personal thing that, again, if you apply to the right schools or considering the right schools for the right reasons, you will not need to um, exhaust yourself for test preparation, given the multitude of college college that no longer needs standardized tests. And, if, you know, the only thing I'll add is right now, you know, obviously college universities are still publicizing scores, but those are all skewed towards a higher end because the only students who are submitting them are doing well on those tests. You know, I will also say, and you know, Veronica, you know, probably will agree with me that we've seen several 1600s in our lifetime. We've seen several 36, 35s, and that does not equal admission because we're gonna go back to say, what did that student do in the classroom? How had they performed over their high school career? Because most of those students who test very well there are some instances where they have a 3.2. So then we're like, this student obviously has a capability. Why haven't they performed at the level they should based upon this? And so these are all questions that are asked. And so that's why it's so difficult to say, oh, what's a good test score? Because we've seen perfect test scores and that doesn't equal admission because there's so much more in the process to consider. I will also you know, say this, and this is you know, a very pointed question that you wanna ask college or universities, what percentage of your incoming class did not submit test scores at all? Because that's going to get in kind of the nuance of this work, because there are some students who do not submit an ACT or ACT score. However, they submit a lot of fives on APs because they did well in those areas. And so, you know, it's good to know how many students just were admitted based upon transcripts, activities, letters of recommendation, and often Oftentimes that number is smaller than schools will say outright, but it is a question that you may want to ask. I just want to say one more thing to underscore the, the importance of the transcript. Tim and I actually met with a family later in the game in March, um, young black student, uh, male, attended a, a, the elite school in Atlanta, um, had great test scores. Just a quick anecdote, not a horror story. Great test scores, a plethora of activities, and a not so great transcript, right? It had a few holes in it that he did not get into the schools that his parents and he thought he would get into given his high testing and activities. The transcript is what reflects what a student has done day, to, day in and day out for four years, right? A test score means that you know how to take these tests well and you knocked it out the park one or two days. <laughs> it's important that you re, that you emphasize to your, to your child, do the best that you can and let that be a reflection of your application more so than a rock star test score that some colleges, like Tim just said, they see those every day. So we wanna make sure that black families in particular don't rely solely on a test score to think that that's guaranteed admission. We, Tim and I have a very, very detailed anecdote to share with you at a later date to, to prove that wrong. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, to that end, there's a question and I'm sure, again, this is a, a larger question that folks will have, um, how can I best guide my child, let's say, 
neither parent graduated from college and the task seems overwhelming. So we have provided a lot of information given our decades of, of experience. What are there, are there annual actionable steps that students can be taking? And I know, Shereen, you started out our conversation with those actionable steps. Um, so if there are resources that we want to be pointing students to um, and how do we want to go about, you know, what <laughs> are you about to hold up the book? I didn't do what, 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 what are you talking about? What are you, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm listening to your question. <laughs> so, yes. So thank you so much for, first of all, for submitting that question, because I think that's one that very often parents feel like they have to figure it out and don't even know what questions to begin to ask. So sure, we'll give you our contact information. You can feel free to contact any one of us, but there are specific resources like, go ahead, Shireen, cue the book. Again, in, um, in all honesty, this the, the book has actually um, a year-to-year -year checklist. We call it a timeline for success that shows you not just what ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th and 12th graders need to be doing at certain points in the process, but then questions to ask. So we understand that correct. there's a question that students must ask, there's a question that parents have to ask, specifically to the school counselor. Again, use your school counselor as a resource, but because Tim and I wrote this book from the point of view of, there are gonna be some families who didn't attend college and, and we get it, but primarily this book was written for what we call the blackish generation. Families that have made, that have, both parents have gone to certain schools and now have made decisions to live in certain environments or send their kids to private schools. Both my children, all my children go to private schools um, out here in the DMV. And we did that intentionally because we wanted to make sure that we closed the information gap. So the book is a resource, not the, but a resource that we very intentionally wrote for this population to understand what you need to do and when so that you stay on task throughout the process. And again, thanks so much for whoever posted that question. But Yes, as Shereem said, there is that direct book, but please lean into any one of us, lean into your high school counselor, lean into your community members. There are folks that can help you navigate this process um, without fear, without shame, because we wanna make sure you have the information necessary. So you've got that, but there, there, there's a FIS guide. And again, we'll provide you some resources after this session to help you get there. So I don't want you to walk away feeling like it's bigger than it needs to be because we're going to make sure you have that information. Um, there are a couple you're questions. You're, you're Tunde, yeah, just yeah. Very, just, I mean, just very quickly. I mean, you know, if you are at an independent or, you know, uh, a, a private school, you have a dedicated college counseling office that has a lot of resources available to them. And you may or may not agree with their assessment. We can talk about how, how good they are. We can go back and forth with that all day. However, you have to be engaged with them. There is there's no way around your college counselor. You know, you know, most schools require, you know, one to three letters and one of them is the college counselor. So that person is going to have to submit information. And yes, you can disagree with the schools they recommend, but that's where the conversation really needs to happen. And obviously, if you're not making any, you know, kind of headway that way, there are secondary resources that you can refer yourself to. But that should be the first place, knowing that, you know, it's a conversation between you and the counselor. It's not that they hand you a list and you have to say yes. You have to say, no, these are the needs of my child. This is, you know, our budget is. These are things we're looking for. Like all of those things have to, you know, happen. And add to the earlier point, there are emails that go out, say, take this inventory, do these different type of things that have to happen. And if you're not engaged at that level, it's going to be hard to have success in this process. Thank you so much for that reminder. As you know, PSB family, this is something we say often, be engaged with your school community read the emails, respond to the emails, make sure you're speaking to, you know who the head of school are, you know who your full administrative, your all your administrators are and be in ready contact with them um, because they're there to help support your child and your family through this process, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I just looking at the questions, the additional questions, going back to testing, um, what if my school does not offer APs? How on earth would um, a college evaluate that application? Um, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, we started out when we talked about like all the seven things, right? The things that we're gonna be thinking about. Um, your college admissions counselors at the places you're applying to, 
they see lots of different types of high schools and they're very used to seeing lots of different curriculum offerings. I think schools also do a really good job of explaining their own educational philosophy and then how they built their curriculum out to meet that. So what most college admissions counselors wanna do is meet a student where they are, the school that they're going to and assess within that school environment. It's completely normal for a school to not offer AP classes as part of their curriculum. They have something else that they offer. Whatever school you go to and whatever curriculum, whatever educational philosophy that school follows, we want to know that you are preparing for the rigors of college within the curriculum offered to you. Um, and then certainly any opportunities you take outside of your school to do that, we would want to know about that too. So we have students that we work with that take great classes at their school. They might take a college class over the summer or do something online or pursue other kinds of you know, intellectual opportunities. You, we can know about those as well. So I, I don't think the average college is looking for one type of curriculum, one type of test, one type of performance. Um, and colleges, quite frankly, are also willing to review lots of different uh, test scores and transfer credits for credit as well, like you would get out of an AP test. So it's okay, whatever your school believes in and however they've built their curriculum, you make sure that you are pursuing the classes that make sense for you at the rigor that shows that you are preparing for college level. And it, it doesn't have to be any one type of curriculum. Absolutely. And coming from my end as a former in-school counselor, every every single high school, at let's say in the PSV community here, will have a um, a school profile. So if you'd like to know, you know, we keep referring to profile, you can either go to the school's website or ask the school counselor for that year's school profile. So you have a sense of when I'm applying, what on earth was Veronica talking about when she said the profile? This is what it is and it is refreshed and updated every year. Thank you so much for that. Um, there are, let's, I think we have exhausted our, the, the questions that were submitted earlier. Um, there was a question about, do I really have to apply to more than 10 schools? No, you don't. You can apply to one, you can apply to two. The process is very individualistic. You do what makes the most sense to you. And as you're working with your counselor through the process, you guys can, as a, as a family team, um, come up with a, a strategy that makes sense. How would you advise a family, Shireen? Uh, pass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, we'll come I, back to you. Yeah, come back to me, come back to me. Okay, no problem. There is another question here in the chat. Hang on, I just saw it. Um, at what grade level uh, do you recommend? Com you can, I would recommend if you have a question or even if you're in fifth grade, make an appointment with the college counselor to ask the question. Um, it doesn't, does not make any sense. And I'm sure the college counselor will be happy to engage you to ask a question um, from where you are. You can't, you know, ask the question from the fifth grade level, how should I be preparing my student? Um, whatever it is, but you can, I would recommend making an appointment to meet with your counselor or a school counselor, the director of the department, whatever, meet, spend some time with them. And let, let me just piggyback on that real quick. I do think that the students usually start becoming aware of colleges and what it is and um, third, fourth, fifth grade, like they start seeing people with sweatshirts. They watch, you know, I call it ESPN, the greatest marketer of colleges out there, for college game day and all that stuff. But what, what you have to start thinking about in middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade is, what is the track that your student is on to take courses such as calculus by the time they're a senior or foreign language? Those are the grades, seventh and eighth grade in particular, where they start course sequencing for high school. So if your child has ambitions of being an advanced AP honors accelerated scholar, make sure that they're on that track, quote unquote, as early as seventh and eighth grade, because what they take in seventh and eighth grade affects what they take in ninth grade, which affects the 10th, 11th, and 12th. So Having conversations, um, like you tend to just said, with your school counselor about that sequencing, understanding the high school curriculum and what the prerequisites are, please do not be shy about that so that you have a full understanding of what the options may be. Yeah. And again, I would preface it by saying, and, and make sure question, you... How... Oh. Yeah, make sure you know, know your students. So when you're having the conversation with the counselor, don't have the counselor... But don't have the conversation about some other kid. Make sure mm -hmm. you know who your child is, what their abilities are, what they are capable of, what their um, potential is, and work from that place. And you know, don't 
Don't have a, a conversation about your neighbor's kid. Have a conversation about the child that is in front of you, who you love and who you're raised. Tim. No, I was just going to say about how many schools that you should uh, apply to. Am I delayed? I think I'm delayed. How, how, many, okay, okay. how many schools you should apply to? It really just depends upon, it really just depends upon, you know, how many, you know, applications you want to complete. Uh, what we would say is don't apply to five schools with admit rates under 8%. Like that's just not a good use of time. You know, you want to say if you, you know, really want to narrow it down and say, I only want to apply to these places, then the admit rate would probably needs to be a significantly 50% 50, 50 or above. So to think about that, but, you know, definitely we would not encourage anybody to say, I'm only going to apply to six schools and all those six schools so happen to have admit rates under 20%, you're really setting yourself up for failure. And that's one thing that we really want to think about the mental health. Like, yeah, you can apply yes. to a lot of places. You can also be denied a lot of places. And what does that do to a psyche of a young child who has excelled and done well to, you know, continue to get deny after deny after deny. So that's why we want people to be very thoughtful. Like any school you're applying to, to there should be a why attached to it why am i yeah. applying to this place and if you answer that question then you'll be successful in this place yes co-signing and all of that um there is a really uh, two great questions i would i would say unfortunately as our final questions of the evening um what are students that are in need of financial aid at a disadvantage if they are unable to apply early decision due to cost. That's a fantastic one. Can we kick you to Veronica and then Tim? Yeah, and we did, we said earlier, right, in terms of the factors in this process, ability to pay, ability to not pay. I mean, this, this is part of what college admissions offices are doing. The average college in America is need aware or need sensitive. That means that they need to balance a financial aid budget. They need to balance possibly a merit scholarship budget. They can still give great financial aid, great scholarships to students. They could even still cover a student's full cost at a college, but they have to pick which students they will do that for. Um, so early decision is when, let's say you, you have done your research, you have found your dream school, you have had that family conversation, that conversation with your school counselor within this community. Applying to a school early, early decision, ED, means that if you are admitted you promise to go there. You're going to cancel your other applications. You're going to go to that one school. So it's intended for students who know under all circumstances that they're going to go to that one school if admitted. That can, in some situations, include financial circumstances. I think colleges uh, have done a lot of work where there have been a lot of things that have been added to this process to make sure that students and families can get estimates when possible. For example, every college is required by law to have on their website a net price calculator. So this is a tool that a college will use. Um, family fills out income and tax and uh, other information. It's a simplified like version of a financial aid form. And based on your info, you can get an estimate of what need-based financial aid or even sometimes merit scholarship might look at at that school. You can look at that estimate and have a real conversation that if we got no more than this, could we make it happen? Could we pursue that early decision option? Most students are applying to schools not under a binding early decision option. The majority of students are applying under non-binding options, early action, rolling decision, regular decision. That's where many colleges get many of their students. That's fairly normal. So I would say that if you, throughout this process, do find the one, the school that you think is the one, and they have early decision, and your family has thought about the cost, and you've had these real conversations with all the people who are helping you, it might be that you end up applying to a school early decision. Most students will find other great ways to apply to colleges, and that includes families that want the real ability to compare costs of colleges. That's okay. There are lots of other rounds. Most students applying to colleges are in other rounds. There is strategy, right? I get that people get excited about early decision, but strategy without authenticity, without conversations, yep. it, you're, we're not going to be able to produce the outcome we want. You got in, but you can't afford to go. You still can't go. Exactly. That's really um, key. We've got time for one last question that is a really, really good one. What if, I'll take this last question. <laughs> what if they, you have a child who don't have AP ambitions, but they enjoy school and perform well in the classes they take, 
We love that child. And there are so many schools. Every school that child applies to will love them too. But of course, you have to apply appropriately um, and uh, apply to schools that are within that that exhibit the same ambition that the students ambition enjoy that the student exhibited throughout their high school time. So we love that child and we can't wait to see their application. So um, you, this you, is- Tunday, just, just yes. very quickly, like just today, I had a conversation with a mom and she's just like, my son, he's a 3.0 student. You know, he hasn't taken the SAT yet. You know, he has some light involvement. And then she shared the list of schools that he was looking at. And I said, he's perfectly fine. Like, you know, there is a place for all students and, you know, they were reasonable about it. I was very clear. I said, he ain't applying to Emory, but the places that you <laughs> said, he's perfectly fine. And I think people just have to be very realistic in this process to know their child and know that there are a number of colleges that would love to have that student. Yes. Obviously, we can go on all night, but we are out of time tonight. We will send um, follow-ups to uh, follow-up resources and contact information for each of us here. But thank you so much. If I can ask each of you to say a 30-second last piece that you want families to know before they hang up and start the new school year, what would you like them to know? Go, Shireen. <laughs> I can't pass again. Um, no. I, it is critical that parents partner with their child. I'm a big believer that for those of us who did it alone or braved it alone 20, 30 years ago, that time has passed. Jeff Salingo is an award-winning journalist who covers uh, education. And he has this phrase of passengers versus drivers. Parents yeah. need to be drivers in this process for our kids that many of us, myself included, have already helicoptered over. Don't drop the ball. Now. I'm not trying to say do it for them. That's not what I'm saying. I said partner. We have to work with our kids to help them to realize their aspirations, but we also have to manage our expectations. So if we partner with our kids, I think you'll have a successful process. Thank you so much. Veronica, we'll kick it to you. Yeah, I think even reflected in some of the questions and things we talked about, uh, I think we forget the order of this process. So it's not, well, what do I need to get into SHU Chicago? What do I have to achieve? What do I have to do? It's here's what I love and here's what I want to do. And then which colleges are the best ones for me, right? We're, we're gonna, we're, we don't want to confuse the order. You do you, and then you're going to find great colleges that are really, really excited about having you there. And you're going to be happy, well, and successful, right? We want, we want all of those things together. Well is an important part of this. So let's not confuse the order. It's not just the achievements. It's who am I? What do I do? What do I want? And then who's the lucky college that gets me in return? Love that. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, I'll just continue to say uh, my mantra is we have to redefine success that, you know, as we applaud mm -hmm. President Barack Obama and his wife for going to Ivy League institutions, we have to applaud uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, who went to historically black college university, Oprah Winfrey, who went to historically black college university, and just know lots of people go different places and there aren't just one set of institutions that will allow students to be successful, but there are any number of institutions as long as that child can thrive and, you know, kind of really find a home and get everything they need out of that school. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And my, my, major takeaway, and I hope folks remember, is we want students to be empowered consumers, empowered, informed consumers. As each of the panelists have already said, we want students to feel excited about where they're going next and be able to thrive and just hit the ground running when they arrive at that place. So thank you all so much. This is obviously a continuing um, panel and series we will uh, conversations we will continue to have. So thank you all so much for spending your time with the PSB family. Everyone, please know we will send you the recording and resources after tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Oh, God. Great. That was so great. <laughs> um we had about at our highest we had 91 so that's about right i mean i expected a little bit more than half yeah
That's so awesome. I'm like, my mind is swirling with ideas. Yeah. Get some more. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. (laughs) To be continued. Have fun. Send me days. Okay. (laughs) Bye.